welcome. This is on a visit to the historical destinations in the district of Aurangabad in Indian state of Maharashtra. The visit was made between January 11 and January 20, 2015. I and my friend Ashu, who was holidaying in India at that time, started from Howrah Station on the 11th January and reached Aurangabad on the 13th after spending a night at the intermediate place of Manmar. Manmar is an important junction station on Mumbai-Delhi route, which also falls on Howrah-Mumbai route. At Manmar, we came to know of the existence of a well-known Gurdwara here. In the morning of resuming our journey to Aurangabad, we made it a point to visit this Gurdwara. The Gurdwara was a big one with dormitories for devotees attached to it. It was learned that the langar, that is a common kitchen or canteen where food is served to all visitors without distinction of background for free, runs here for 24 hours a day for seven days a week. Historically looking, one would find amazing facts about this Gurdwara. Guru Gobind Singh Ji brought two royal prisoners from Satara Fort by air route here by holding the stirrups of his horse. The names of the prisoners were Balarao and Rustam Rao. There was then a dance forest at the place of Gurdwara. Sant Baba Nidhan Singh Ji started Khorsheva here by clearing the dance forest with the help of his people. A hidden bauli, that is a well, was found while constructing the Gurdwara. After cleaning the well, it was noticed that the water of the well was divine and sweet. Because of this hidden well, the Gurdwara was later named as Gurdwara Guptasar Sahib. A photo show on our visit will now follow, starting with snapshots on Manmar and its Gurdwara and having a narration in a different voice on various important aspects as it proceeds. Hope you will enjoy it. On the 13th afternoon we left Manmad, and reached Aurangabad at around 5 p.m. With Aurangabad as our base we visited Ajunta, Elora, Dalit Abbot, Bibkam Akbara, and adjoining spots of historical and religious significance. Here are details of our visit. Visit of Ajunta Caves, on the 14th at 8 in the morning, I and my friend Asu started for Ajunta by our rented car. Ajunta is about 100 kilometers from Aurangabad. We moved along Aurangabad Delhi Road for a good length and then diverted for Ajunta. The road was excellent and roadside view eye-catching. On the way in a roadside eatery we had our breakfast. The car took us to a point at Ajunta from where we had to avail of the bus services run by Maharashtra Road Transport Corporation for a distance of 4 kilometers or so to get to the riding point for the caves. No other vehicle is allowed in this stretch of the road. The bus fare was rupees 15 per head. One has also to pay rupees 10 extra for the amenities provided within the Ajunta base area. There are 30 caves altogether in Ajunta. These are located quite high in the hills and one has to climb through steep stairs to view them. Dolis with porters are available to carry old and infirm to the caves at rupees 1000 per doli at the rates fixed by Archaeological Survey of India. It was not possible for us to climb the large number of stairs at our age, 
and as such we hired two dolies. I have included a couple of our photographs on dolly at the concluding part of this photo show. It was a unique experience to be carried on a dolly on the shoulders of four persons through steep stairs, circuitous at places. Every moment you would have the dreadful feeling of falling down. Little off from the stairs on the side opposite the caves you would have an awe-inspiring sight of the deep gorge beneath which flows the river Wagura. This river Wagura is in high spate in monsoon but its bed remains dried up in winter and summer. Due to steepness of the stairs the dolly becomes almost vertical at some points and it is at these points, in particular, you would feel engulfed in horror, and curse your decision to ride on a dolly. In spite of all these dreadful feelings, we completed our adventure successfully and returned safely as did other dolly riders in the past and the present. Of the 30 caves we had visited 16, the others being incomplete, of lesser importance or inaccessible to us due to their height and steepness. There was no way for dolies to move to the areas where some of these were located. The caves we visited were cave numbers 1, 2, 4, 5, 9, 10, 12, 16, 17, and 19. While presenting the exterior and interior views of the caves we visited, I shall try to highlight the special features of these caves wherever possible. But the photographs and the narration will not obviously synchronize, the related pictures will pass off before the turn for describing it comes, as you might have noticed by now. Out of 30 caves in Ajunta, 5 caves are Chaitayas, temples, while the remaining 25 are Viharas or monasteries. These are all Buddhist caves and date back from 2nd century BC to about 480 or 650 CE. The caves are cut into steep face of a deep rock gorge. Cave number 8, 9, 10, 12, 13, and 30 are the earliest Hinayana caves, while the rest are the Mahayana caves. In Hinayana cult the Buddha was never represented directly, he was always represented by a symbol such as the stupa, the Bodhi tree, footprint, or will of the law. In the later stage Mahayana cult started worshipping Buddha's images directly. In Ajunta we have rock-cut architecture, sculpture, and paintings. Paintings are of two types, the ceiling paintings and the wall paintings. The ceiling paintings are purely decorative in nature, subjects of paintings being flowers, plants, fruits, birds, animals, mythical animals, and semi-divine beings. Wall paintings generally called mural paintings are narrative and religious in nature as they depict the Jataka tales and all the important events and legends related to the life of Lord Buddha. The paintings and sculptures of Ajunta have been described by Archaeological Survey of India as the finest surviving examples of Indian art, particularly the paintings which are masterpieces of Buddhist religious art with figures of Buddha and depiction of Jataka tales. Flashlight photography is not allowed inside the caves as this causes damage to the sculptures and particularly the paintings. It is, therefore, extremely difficult to have distinct pictures of these artifacts. Let us now peep into some of the caves particularly those we visited to have a glimpse of the treasure hidden there. Cave number 1, this is a Buddhist monastery of Mahayana cult. Architecturally, it is said to be the finest monastery amongst the rock-hewn temples of India. The columns of the veranda are adorned with beautiful sculptures of the Buddha and the Celestials. Above the columns of the veranda are numerous friezes depicting scenes from the life of the Buddha, the animal fights and hunting expedition. Most importantly this cave has a seated Buddha in Dermach Hakrapravartana Madra, preaching attitude, in the sanctum, and world-famous painted depiction of Padmapani and Vajrapani. Besides, it depicts Sibi, Samkapala, Mahajanaka, Maha Amaga, Champaya Jatakas, and the scene depicting temptation of Mara. Cave number 2, this is also a Mahayana monastery. This consists of cells, sanctum sanctorum, and two pillared sub-shrines. Seated Buddha in Dermach Hakrapravartana Madra is enshrined in the sanctum and the side sub-shrines contain two yaksha figures, popularly known as Sankhanadi and Padmanihai, to the east and Haratai and her consort Pansika to the right. This cave is famous for extensive ceiling painting. The Jatakas painted here are Viad Hurapandita and Ruru and Miracle of Sravasti, Ashtabhaya, Avalakitesvara, The Dream of Maya. Cave number 4, 
This is the largest monastery cave at Ajunta supported by 28 massive pillars. It consists of the hall, a sanctum sanctorum and a pillared veranda. The door frame is exquisitely sculptured. In the right is carved the famous image of Bodhisattva Avalokitesvara as reliever of eight great perils. In the interior part of the central hall, Sava Mandapa, the ceiling preserves a unique geological feature of a lava flow. In the shrine Buddha's image in Padmasana is elegant. The cave was once painted, fragments of which can be noticed. Cave number 5, the monastery is an unfinished one. It has, however, a richly framed door frame. The main entrance is also lavishly painted with amorous couples and beautiful maidens of the doorkeepers called Sal Banjakas. Cave number 9, this chaita or prayer hall is one of the earliest Hinayana caves at Ajunta. It dates back to 2nd century BC. The facade is beautified with a horseshoe-shaped chitya window. The Chaitagraha consisting of an entrance door, two side windows and central hall is flanked by two side aisles, Pradikshana, on either side separated by a row of 23 pillars and a non-ornamental stupa, the object for worship. The Chaitagraha exhibits reproduction of wooden architectural style, in the form of inward tapering octagonal pillars, evidence of fixing wooden beams and rafters etc. At the frontage the standing images of the Buddha flanking the Chaita arch seems to be later Mahayana additions and indicates the great influence of Gandhara school of art. Inside the Chaita is seen two layers of paintings, the earlier dating back to the second half of the 1st century BC and the latter to 5th to 6th centuries AD. Cave 10, this is the oldest Hinayana Chaita. In 1891, John Smith, a British army officer noticed the huge arch of this cave from the viewpoint which ultimately led to the discovery of Ajunta Caves. This cave has the highest facade of 45 feet. A Brahmi inscription in the facade dated to the 2nd century BC reads, Vasithaputakatahati. The cave is similar in design to cave number 9. Like the other Chaita it too consists of a large central hall, and is flanked by two aisles, Pradikshana, on two sides separated by 39 octagonal pillars. The ceiling is vaulted, arched, and was originally fitted with timber rafters. There is a huge stupa at the center, which had been the objects of worship of the earliest Buddhists. The cave is adorned with paintings of two periods, the earlier belonging to 2nd century BC and the later to 4th to 6th century AD. According to Archaeological Survey of India, two Jataka stories of the earlier period have been identified. These are Sama, or Shama, Jataka and the Chhatan Tajataka. The later period paintings contain Buddha in various poses mainly on the pillars. Cave number 12, this Hinayana monastery consists of a hall, the front wall of which has completely collapsed. It has 12 cells arranged on its three sides. An inscription on the back wall of the monastery records the gift of this cave by one merchant Ganamadatta and paleographically datable to 2nd to 1st century BC possibly slightly later than Cave 10, says Archaeological Survey of India report. The cell frontage is decorated with Chaita window motifs above the door opening. Cave number 16, this monastery is in the middle of the Horseshoe Mountain. There is an inscription on the left side wall outside the veranda which says the excavation of this cave was caused by Varahadeva, the minister of Vakataka King Harisena, circa AD 475-500. The cave consists of a central hall surrounded by 14 cells on three sides, vestibule, and a sanctum of Buddha image. The hall is supported by 20 pillars. The ceiling of the front aisle is decorated with stone rafters and beams. The important painted themes depict conversion of Nanda, miracle of Sravasti, Maya's dream, and some incidents from the life of Buddha. The Jataka stories evolve round Hasti, Maha Amaga, Maha Sudasama. The chief attraction of this monastery is the gigantic image of the Buddha in preaching attitude. The image is detached from the back wall and a processional path is also provided. Once the monastery was entirely painted, but due to the weak mud plaster nearly all paintings have been destroyed. However, some of the Ajunta's finest and remarkable paintings can still be seen in the cave. 
The cave is well known for the world famous painting of the dying princes. Cave number 17, a Brahmi inscription found here recorded that the excavation of this cave was done by a feudatory prince under Vakataka King Hari Sena, AD 475 to 500. The monastery consists of a spacious hall surrounded by 17 cells on the three sides, a vestibule, and a sanctum containing the image of Buddha. Once it was fully decorated with wonderful paintings. The mural paintings in this cave are stupendous and well preserved. Above the entrance of the monastery there are seven images of Buddha engraved on stone. Some of the well preserved paintings belong to Vakataka age and these include Vizantir Jataka, right of the door, a huge and gigantic wheel representing the the will of life, flying Apsara, to the left of the door, subjugation of Nalagiri, a wild elephant, by Buddha at Rajagriha, Buddha preaching to a congregation. The Jatakas depicted here are Chhadanta, Mahakapi, in two versions, Hasti, Hamsa, Vesantara, Mahasudasoma, Sarabhamiga, Moksha, Mataposaka, Sama, Mahasa, Valahas, Sibi and Nigradham and God. Cave number 19, this Chaitagriha belongs to 5th century AD. It is the best specimen of Buddhist rock-cut architecture. Its facade is ornate with Buddha's figure from top to bottom. The Chaita arch at the frontage is imposing and enhances the beauty of the cave temple. Two life-size images of Yaksha with their ornate jewelry and fascinating hairstyle adorns the two sides of Chitya Bhattayana, windows. The stupa in this Chitya is carved with a standing image of Buddha. The hall has painted portrayal of Buddha in other postures. Elora, on the 15th morning at 9 a.m., Asu and myself started by the same rented car of yesterday, this time for Elora. The scenic beauty of the road to Elora was magnificent. There were luxuriant trees and hills all around. At places one could also see a range of hills when one drives through this route. The roadside trees form beautiful natural arches here and there as their branches from opposite sides come together at the top. After about two hours we came across Krishineswar temple at a village called Viral. This temple is an ancient pilgrimage site revered as one of the twelve Jyotirlingas of Shiva. This Jyotirlinga is in fact the last or the twelfth one. The temple is in close proximity of Ellora. The temple stands as an illustration of the prehistoric temple traditions as well as of the prehistoric architectural style and structure. The inscriptions on the temples are a source of much attraction to ardent travelers. The temple, built of red rocks, is composed of a five-tier shakara. It enshrines the Shiva Lingam and a marble image of Parvati. This Chutur Linga is said to be self-oriented. We did not have the opportunity to enter the temple as we were short of time for Elora and were not allowed to carry the camera inside the campus. Behind the Grishineswar temple there was a very old edifice which too I visited. A new temple had come up on the way to the edifice. We reached the base of the Karanandri hills, belonging to the Sahyadri range of the Deccan, on the vertical face of which the caves of Ellora have been excavated. It is a world heritage site and represents one of the largest rock-hewn monastic temple complexes in the entire world. Elora is also world famous for the single largest monolithic excavation, the Great Kailasa, Cave 16. At Elora one can have a glimpse of channels, near Cave 32, through which the volcanic lava once flowed. These channels, due to overheating, have a characteristic brownish-red color. Similar rock was used in the construction of the Grishneshwar temple nearby, and also utilized for the flooring of the pathways of Bibi Kamakbara, Source, Archaeological Survey of India. Elora is located directly on the ancient trade route from Pradesh Tana via Aurangabad, Elora, Pidalkora, Patni, Nazika, modern Nazik. The location of Elora on the ancient trade route did not however induce any activity during the Satvahana rule though there were brisk activities at other places including Nazika falling on this route. However, as the multiplication of religious establishments occurred all around Maharashtra the ideal location of Elora could not but attract attention. Thus grew on the largest cave excavations at Elora, that two of three different religious dispensations namely, Buddhism, Brahmanism and Jainism. 
these caves are datable from 6th to 7th century AD to 11th to 12th century AD. In all there are 100 caves in the hill range of which 34 are famous and visited. Of these 34 caves 12, cave number 1 to 12, are Buddhist, 17, cave number 13 to 29, are Brahmanical and rest 5, cave number 30 to 34, are Jaina. These caves are spread wide apart. We hired an auto rickshaw to take us around. Our visit started from cave number 29 and ended with cave number 16. In some of these caves we went inside, had detailed view and took photographs of sculpture and architecture. For, others being incomplete or being not of much importance, we had external view only and had photographed the facade. The caves which we viewed in details were cave numbers 29, 30, 32, 33, 10, 11, 12, 21 and 16. In the other group were cave numbers 7 and 8, 9, 13, 14, 20. Brief descriptions of the caves we viewed in details are presented here. Buddhist Caves The Buddhist caves at Ellora somewhat resembles those of Ajunta. These caves include 11 viharas, monasteries, and only one chaita, chapel. Cave number 10, Viswakarma or Carpenter's Cave is the only Chaita cave in the group. It follows the pattern of construction of cave number 19 and 26 of Ajunta. At the front of the Chaita there is a rock cut court which is entered through a flight of steps. On either side, are pillared porticos with chambers in their back walls. The pillared veranda of the Chaita has a small shrine at either end and a single cell in the far end of the back wall. The corridor columns have massive square shafts and gatapalava, vase and foliage, capitals. The main hall is apsidal on plan and is divided into a central nave and side aisles by 28 octagonal columns with plain bracket capitals. In the apsidal end of the Chaita Hall is a stupa on the face of which a colossal 3.30 meter high seated Buddha in Vyakyanama draw, teaching posture, is carved. A large Bodhi tree is carved at the back. The hall has a vaulted roof in which ribs have been carved in the rock imitating the wooden ones. Cave number 11, known as Duthal, two-storied, had a third story discovered in 1876 at the lowest level being a veranda with a shrine and two cells at the back of it. The middle level has eight pillars at the front and five rear cells of which only three at the center are completed and decorated. The upper level has a porch opening into a long corridor hall with a Buddha shrine at the rear. Images of Durga and Ganesh suggest that the cave was later used by the Hindus. Cave number 12, Tinthal, three-storied, has cells for sleeping, stone benches, on the lower floor. The second story consists of a big hall. The third story of this cave is very important. There are 14 impressive images of Buddha, seven in preaching attitude and other seven in meditation attitude. The rows of seven Buddhas are symbolic of the belief that he appears on earth every 5,000 years and has already visited it seven times. Hindu Caves The Hindu caves were constructed between the middle of 6th century to the end of the 8th century. As per available information the work first commenced in caves 28, 27, and 19. These were followed by two most impressive caves constructed in the early phase, caves 29 and 21. Along with these two, work was underway at caves 20 and 26, and slightly later at caves 17, 19, and 28. The caves 14, 15, and 16 were constructed during the Rash Tracuta period. The work began in caves 14 and 15 and culminated in cave 16. All these structures represent a different style of creative vision and execution skills. Some were of such complexity that they required several generations of planning and coordination to complete. Cave number 29, this, the second best cave next to Kailash is called Dumerlina and Sitanahani, bathroom of Siddha, it is similar to the caves at Elephanta Island in Mumbai in concept. There are three entrances to the cave guarded by seated lions. Dating back to 7th century and belonging to Chalukyan period this cave is so excavated that enough sunlight comes into it. The cave has 26 big and beautifully carved pillars. There are figures of Siva killing the demon and Hakka, 
Shiva as Nataraja, Shiva in Padmasan Madra and Goddess Yamuna riding on tortoise etc. Cave number 21, close to the last temple, and behind a fine large platform, is a lofty and interesting Saiva temple with an attractive facade. It is locally known as Ramasvara. With portraits of beautiful women, this cave is excellently carved and belong to the earlier phase at Ellora, dating from the 6th century Kalashure period. In the court before it, on a lofty pedestal with bas reliefs on the side of it, couches Anandi, in a chapel on the north side with two pillars in front is Ganapati, and between it and the pilaster is a gigantic female standing on a makara, with dwarf attendants. On the south side is a similar figure on a tortoise. A screen wall half the size of the pillars connects the front ones. The capitals of the four in front are carved in representation of a kamandala with plants growing out of it and drooping over on each side. To this are added struts carved with female figures standing under foliage, with their attendant dwarfs. The frieze above is carved in compartments of arabesques divided by fat ganas. The hall in which we landed on entering the cave was a large one having a height of 16 feet and an area 69 feet by 251 feet. It had a chapel at each end cut off by two cushion capital pillars. Each of these chapels were surrounded by sculptors depicting Hindu gods and goddesses in various activities. Amongst these one could see the followings. A. On the left is Siva dancing, eight-armed, while gods riding on peacock, elephant, ox, eagle etc. appear in the clouds over his shoulders. Parvati and musicians look on below, and a small Baitringi dances behind Siva's legs. B. Marriage of Shiva, Brahma acts as a priest and sits with a fire before him, while a bearded figure is seated on the other side of it. Behind him are two males, one carrying a box. Then comes Parvati with a female behind her, and a male with a round jar. Siva takes Parvati's hand, and in front is a small figure of Ganesha, while behind Siva and four other attendants, one with a conch. See, Shiva and Parvati sitting on Kalish with their attendants while Ravana with five heads trying to shake the Kalish. D. The shrine consists of a square pedestal with a water-rotted linga in it. A wide and lofty circumambulatory surrounds it. E. Beautiful ornamentation as also figures of women and animals could be seen on the body of massive pillars supporting the cave. Cave number 16, Cave 16, also known as the Kailasa Temple, is the unrivaled centerpiece of Ellora. This is designed to recall Mount Kailash, the abode of Lord Shiva looks like a freestanding, multi-storied temple complex, but it was carved out of one single rock, and covers an area double the size of Parthenon in Athens. Initially the temple was covered with white plaster thus even more increasing the similarity to snow-covered Mount Kailash. At the entrance gate, the threshold between the profane and the sacred worlds, the goddesses Gunga and Yamuna form the door jam suggesting purification by their waters. Just inside are two seated sages, Vaishya, the legendary author of Mahabharata and Valmiki who wrote Ramayana. In the porch four columns carry the Indian vase and foliage motif, a symbol of fecundity and prosperity. On each side of the doorway there are images of Kabura, the god of wealth with other symbols of well-being such as the conch shells and the lotus. Two more figures Ganesh, left, and Durga, right, complete the welcoming party. In the cubicle opposite is Lakshmi, the goddess of wealth. All the carvings are done in more than one level. A two-storied gateway resembling a South Indian Gopura opens to reveal a U-shaped courtyard. The courtyard is edged by columned galleries three stories high. The galleries are punctuated by huge sculpted panels, and alcoves containing enormous sculptures of a variety of deities. Originally flying bridges of stone connected these galleries to central temple structures, but these have fallen. Within the courtyard are three structures. As is traditional in Shiva temples, the first is a large image of the sacred bull Nandi in front of the central temple. The central temple, Nandi Mantapa or Mandapa, houses the Lingam. The Nandi Mandapa stands on 16 pillars and is 29.3 meter high. The base of the Nandi Mandapa has been carved to suggest that life-sized elephants are holding the structure aloft. 
A living rock bridge connects the Nandi Mandapa to the Shiva temple behind it. The temple itself is a tall pyramidal structure reminiscent of a South Indian Dravidian temple. The shrine, complete with pillars, windows, inner and outer rooms, gathering halls, and an enormous lingam at its heart carved from living stone, is carved with niches, pilasters, windows as well as images of deities, mithunas, erotic male and female figures, and other figures. Most of the deities at the left of the entrance are Shivaite, followers of Shiva, while on the right hand side the deities are Vaishnavites, followers of Vishnu. There are two Dvahastamhas, pillars with the flagstaff, in the courtyard. The grand sculpture of Ravana attempting to lift Mount Kailasa, the abode of Lord Shiva, with his full might is a landmark in Indian art. The construction of this cave was a feat of human genius it entailed the removal of 200,000 tons of rock, and took 100 years to complete. Jain Caves The five Jain Caves at Ellora belong to the 9th and 10th centuries. They all belong to the Digambara sect. Jain Caves reveal specific dimensions of Jain philosophy and tradition. They reflect a strict sense of asceticism they are not relatively large as compared to others, but they present exceptionally detailed artworks. The most remarkable Jain shrines are the Chudo Kailash, Cave 30, the Indra Sava, Cave 32, and the Jagannath Sava, Cave 33. Cave 31 is an unfinished four-pillared hall and a shrine. Cave 34 is a small cave, which can be approached through an opening on the left side of Cave 33. Cave number 32, Cave 32, known as Indra Sava is a two-storied cave with one more monolithic shrine in its court. It has a very fine carving of the lotus flower on the ceiling. Besides the finely carved lotus flower one can see signs of painted figures among clouds in the ceiling of the shrine. In this cave a simple gateway leads into an open court in the middle of which stands the shrine. At the center of the shrine is the Sarvedobhadra, a concept in Jainism of worshipping the four important Tirthankaras, viz, Adinatha or Arshivanatha, first, Parsvanatha, 22nd, Neminatha, 23rd, and Mahavira, 24th. The images of these Tirthankaras are depicted on the cardinal directions. The superstructure of the shrine is in Dravidian order with local variations. The walls have carvings of elephants, lions, and Tirthankaras. The lower of the two stories is incomplete. The court leads to multiple shrines, two on the west, one on the north and one on the east. All these shrines are primarily dedicated to Mahavira, flanked by his attendant deities, Indra on elephant and Ambika on lion. The side walls of the shrines usually depict the images of Gameteshvara, the son of Rishavanatha, in penance, Parsvanatha with the snakehood and subsidiary deities. Cave number 33, it is similar to cave number 32 and is known as Jagannath Sava. It consists of five independent shrines, each with a three-columned mandapa and some good sculptures. It has carvings of Mahavira, Matanga, and Siddhayaka disposed on two levels. Cave number 30, this cave is known as Choto Kailash because of it being a small and incomplete replica of Kailasnath temple. First similarity is the facade which is almost the same. The entrance is narrow under which there are pillars on either side. However, these have never been properly carved. There is an idol of Chakraswar with ten hands and a nice headdress. Half of the body has been destroyed and we can find female attendants and five of the ten hands today. This cave with a freestanding temple in the middle of a court has pillars and ceilings which are adorned with carved lotus flower. The columned shrine has 22 Tirthankaras with Mahavar in the sanctuary. Thus completing the visit of the caves in Ellora we visited Zion Uddin Shirazi's Darga and Hanuman temple on our way back. There is not much to mention about Hanuman temple which is of recent origin. In Zion Uddin Shirazi's Darga we visited tombs of Aurangzeb and his son Azam Shah besides the mausoleum of Sayyid Zion Uddin, a Mohammedan saint, highly revered by the Muslims. Aurangzeb's tomb is in the southeast angle of this courtyard. Facing it is a long low building similar to the one in the other quadrangle, and in the north there is a small room containing the pall and decorations of the tomb. 
The grave lies immediately to the right of the entrance and is remarkably simple in keeping with Aurangzeb's own wishes. The grave lies in the middle of a stone platform raised about half a foot from the floor. The tomb was covered with a white sheet and there was only flower petals offered by devotees on it. Aurangzeb funded his resting place by knitting caps and copying Quran during the last years of his life and these he sold anonymously in the marketplace. Unlike the other great Mughal rulers, Aurangzeb's tomb is not marked with a large mausoleum. Instead he was interred in an open-air grave place in accordance with his Islamic principles. The gateway and doomed porch was added later in 1760. The floor is marble. A neat railing of perforated marble is on three sides and the walls of Burhanuddin's Darga form the fourth side. It was erected by the Nizam at the request of Lord Curzon. Aurangzeb selected this place for his final resting in order to be able to be by the side of the great Muslim saint. Close by the side of Aurangzeb's tomb are the tomb of his son Azam Shah and his wife and daughter. Azam Shah's grave has a small marble headstone with carved floral designs. Bibi Kamakbara, after the first day's visit of Dalit Abbot which has been described later, we moved to Bibi Kamakbara. We reached there at around 5.30 p.m. The sun was on its way down and the setting was perfect for clean photography. Bibi Kamakbara, the replica of Taj Mahal is the only example of Mughal architecture of its kind in Deccan Plateau. It is a beautiful mausoleum of Rabia Aldorani alias Dilraz Banu Begum, the wife of the Mughal Emperor Aurangzeb, 1658-1707 AD. This mausoleum is believed to have been constructed by Prince Azam Shah in memory of his mother between 1651 and 1661 AD. An inscription found on the main entrance door mentions that this mausoleum was designed and erected by Italia, an architect, and Hans Batrai, an engineer respectively. The marble for this mausoleum was brought from mines near Jaipur. Tavernier mentioned that during his journey from Surat to Golconda he had seen around 300 carts laden with marbles being drawn by at least 12 oxen. The mausoleum draws its inspiration from the world-famous Taj Mahal of Agra, constructed between 1631 and 1648 AD, and hence it is rightly known as the Taj of Deccan. It is made mostly of sandstone and has plastered walls and a marble dome. The pavement leading up to the mausoleum is flanked by rows of trees and an oblong reservoir with a row of fountains, dividing the pathway. The reservoir is presently dried up. The mausoleum is built on a high square platform with four minarets at its corners, which is approached by a flight of steps from the three sides. The mortal remain of Rabia al Dorani is placed below the ground level surrounded by an octagonal marble screen with exquisite designs, which can be approached by a descending flight of steps. The roof of this chamber that corresponds to the ground level of the mausoleum is pierced by an octagonal opening and given a low barricaded marble screen. Thus the tomb can be viewed from the ground level also through this octagonal opening. The mausoleum is crowned by a dome pierced with trellis works and accompanying panels decorated with flower designs. The mausoleum was intended to rival the Taj Mahal, but, the decline in architecture and proportions of the structure had resulted in a poor copy of the latter. Even this decline cannot stop one appreciating the setting of the tomb complex in a garden setting with the mountain ranges behind providing as a backdrop. A huge U-shaped gap in between the hills behind provides the perfect harmony in which the mausoleum is blended. Dulut Abbot Fort, to cover this fort in greater details we had visited it in two consecutive days, the 15th and the 16th of January 2015. On the first day, on way back from Ajunta we arrived here at around 2 to 30 p.m. and stayed up to 5 p.m. before leaving for Bibi Kamakbara. This fort was built by Yadeva king of Bhilama V in the 12th century AD. This fort was previously known as Devgari. After the conquest of Devgari in 1296 AD by Aladdin Kilji it remained as a principal stronghold for many years. In 1327 AD Sultan Muhammad bin Tughlaq moved his capital from Delhi to Devgari and renamed it as Dalt Abbot or the City of Fortune. The fort stands on a conical hill at a height of about 200 meters. 
Much of the lower slopes of the hill has been cut away by Yadava dynasty rulers to leave 50 meter vertical sides to improve defenses. The defense system that made Dalit Abbot virtually impregnable comprised fortification by double or even triple rows of massive walls. The entrance through the outer wall is by a strong hornwork consisting of a succession of gateways and courts. It has very thick and lofty walls convoluted on the outer faces and is defended by large bastions both without and within the courts. A barbican of later date, the entrance to which has been broken away, stands in front of this hornwork. On the right of the entrance gateway is an enormous bastion. The face of the gateway above the door has been pierced with three large openings for artillery. The entrance from the barbican to the first court is through a lofty vaulted passage with a turn midway and two-leaved door at the entrance, a large recess for the guard on right and stairway to the parapet wall over the gate on the left. The doors at the main entrance were made of wood of such strength that these did not decay over the centuries and remains almost intact even today. All these doors were fixed with closely spaced iron spikes of appropriate girth to resist elephant attacks by enemies' elephant brigades. The doors were further strengthened by heavy batons behind spaced at short intervals. The doors are further secured when closed by a square timber bar drawn out from a long socket in one jam, passed behind the door and fitted into a socket in the other jam. The iron spikes are arranged in horizontal rows up the face of the door. The next gateway is defended by strong towers and an embattled parapet. There is only one two-leaved door here but it is of the usual heavy constructions and armed with iron spikers. Within the doorway are two guard rooms, each of two vaulted bays. In the next court, facing the second gateway, is a large conical tower which has lost its upper part, and from this tower about midway in its height, projects a covered balcony supported on sculptured corbels. To reach the following gate in the hornwork one must pass diagonally through the court exposed to attack from all sides. This gateway, closed only by a single two-leaf door, is much narrower than those already passed. The second curtain has a simpler entrance with still narrower gateway and the entrance is defended from within by a guard room on either side of the passage at issue. This fortress enclosed an area occupied by the ruins of the palaces of Tughluk and of later days. The outer part has also numerous ruined buildings palaces, temples, and mosques. We could not negotiate beyond this and to the citadel due to the steepness of the way and the stairs. Besides the fortifications Devagiri alias Dalit Abbot contains several notable monuments, of which the chief are the Chand Minar and the Chini Mahal. The Chand Minar is a tower 210 feet, 64 meters, high and 70 feet, 21 meters, in circumference at the base, and was originally covered with beautiful Persian glazed tiles. It was erected in 1445 by Allah Uddin Bahamani to commemorate his capture of the fort. The Chini Mahal, or China Palace, is the ruin of a building once of great beauty. In it Abul Hasan Tana Shah, the last of the Qutab Shahi kings of Golconda, was imprisoned by Aurangzeb in 1687. Unfortunately, due to our age, the steepness of the path and the height at which the citadel is situated we could not reach up to it. The citadel had the most important aspects of the defense system of the fort as I found in different writings on this. A huge palatial construction of stone and lime, called Baradari which used to be favorite summer resort of the kings and moguls, is also situated here. Besides, a heavy cannon of 18th century, the 16th century footmark of Janardhan Swami and the bastion with Durga Topi made from an alloy of five metals ET are preserved here. Aurangabad Caves, a few kilometers off from Aurangabad exist 12 caves carved out of hillside. These are known as Aurangabad Caves. All these are Buddhist caves. These were excavated between 3rd and 6th century AD and present a fine piece of architecture. These caves are divided into two groups, Western and Eastern. Cave number 1 to 5 belong to the Western group while cave number 6 to 12 constitute the Eastern group. A major chunk of these caves are Viharas. Of these 12 caves we visited cave number 6 and 7 only, others being not of much importance as also inaccessible to us due to their heights. Let us now see what the two caves we visited have inside them. 
Cave number 7 consists of a pillared veranda with pillared chapel on either side housing Harati and Panchika in the right chapel and a panel of six goddesses in the left chapel flanked by Padmapani on the left and Buddha on the right. A central door leads to a square hall and a shrine with circumambulatory passage. To the left of the central door is seen a large sculptural panel of Avalokitesvara in the attitude of savior of eight great perils of fire, robber, fetters, shipwreck, lion, snake, elephant, and demon. The walls of the sanctum are rich and exquisitely carved, which are the best specimen at Aurangabad caves. The central image is a colossal seated Buddha in preaching attitude. The entrance of the shrine is guarded by a sculptural panel with a goddess at the center, probably Tara flanked by female figures. The side walls of the sanctum have two more interesting compositions. The right wall has probably the figures of Loksvara and Tara, both in standing posture while the left has a beautiful and superb composition of a dancing female in the midst of six seated female musicians playing different musical instruments. The cave is regarded as the most interesting as it has the figures of women scantily clad and ornately bejeweled indicating rise of tantric influence on Buddhism. Cave number 6 has a sanctum, a pillared porch and a veranda having cells on either side. Apart from the central sanctum which houses the Buddha image, three cells on either side of the sanctum are also seen here. Two of these have an image of Buddha on either side of the sanctum. Our next place of visit was Sonari Mahal Museum, also known as Solon Museum, located at the foothills of Aurangabad Caves. It is named after the painting of this palace once painted in gold. The entire structure of palace is made of stone and lime. However currently it has been converted into a museum and serves as a great tourist place in Aurangabad. We completed our trip to Aurangabad with this visit to the museum. Here ends the narration on our visit to the historical destinations of Aurangabad district. Thanks and goodbye. Scripted by Ajoy Kumar Das with materials from various sources.